as Herman pointed out, I've been involved in this Blavatsky Letters Project, and I was asked to talk a little bit about it so that some of you know what I'm doing, but others haven't heard this. There's two wonderful segues from this presentation about NIPRO to uh, this talk about this Letters Project. Uh, but first, I want to start with a, a brief history of the project. It started with Boris Dzerkov. In about 1924, he began collecting, compiling uh, the works of H.P. Blavatsky, who he was a second cousin once or twice removed of, uh, of H.P.B. He was interested in, in his relative, but didn't get started till he came to the U.S. and then was invited to Point Loma. And there he was encouraged to begin this project. 1924, he started collecting and working on the Collected Writings Project. He died in 1981, and when he died, he had 14 volumes, or 13 volumes, of Collected Writings. Number 13 was at the press when he passed. There were a few people working with him, Boris's girls. Um, my teacher, Vonda, was one of them, working in Chicago. Through Vonda, I met Dara Eklund. And Dara did a great deal of work with Boris. And when Boris passed away, Dara finished volume 14. And her and her husband, Nicholas Weeks, created the index, the Comprehensive Index, Volume 15. Then Dara went on to do the collected writings of William Kwan Judge, three volumes of the Echoes of the Orient. Through Vonda, I met Dara. I visited with her very often. Every time I'd go out to California, I'd go down and maybe between Ojai and the airport, I would stop and visit with them. So we get, got to be pretty good friends. In about 2002, 2003, we knew that John Algio was working on the first volume of the, collect, uh, the personal letters of H.P. Blavatsky. Boris had collected personal letters as well as her public writings that were published in the collected writings, but never got the opportunity to publish. So when John Algio did that first volume, by the way, there was a fellow in Australia, a guy named John Cooper, who had worked on the project before John Algio. Um, but when John finally published volume one of the personal letters of HPB, I immediately got it and read it, and I'm thinking, this stuff is great. This adds another dimension to what we know of HPB. It's actually a different HPB than what you're used to from her public writings, and certainly from her uh, major books. Uh, her major books were perhaps not her the way the personal letters are. They were through her. And so it's a different sort of HPB. So after John Algio published volume one in 2003, I was ready for more. And we didn't know when volume two was going to come out, but I would visit Dara and Nicholas again. And around that time, John Algio's wife, uh, Adele, took ill and then passed away. And shortly thereafter, John's health turned south. John is still with us, but um, incommunicado in a, a, a living center in Bowling Green, Kentucky. So John may be listening on other planes, but not on the internet. Um, but it became apparent that John wasn't going to be able to continue. So our discussion began, well, who's going to do volume two? And there are several people in the movement that would be just perfect for this. Uh, Michael Gomes in New York is a good example. But Michael didn't want it. 
I think these guys who I suggested were more interested in being able to do one project and then another project and then another, whereas this letters project is probably going to be the rest of your life. So they didn't want to get tied down with it. And Dara, bless her heart, said, you ought to do it. And I'm thinking, surely you jest. Uh, <laughs> I'm not the guy. I don't have the skills or experience or training or anything like that. So let's work on these other guys and see if we can get them to do this. And that went on for several years, to a couple of years. Um, but she would continue to suggest that I take this project on. And I continued to say, no. Um, fast forward a little bit. Uh, I had been talking with Dara about it, but it was just really between her and I. Uh, there was a Theosophical Education Conference here in Wheaton. What year was that? 2014? Uh, so that many years after volume one. And uh, Herman and I wanted to talk about uh, ITC business, and he invited me over to the hotel we were talking. And he said, when we finished, he said, Yoko wants to talk. Could you come down and, uh, or could you wait till she comes down? I say, sure. And so Johanna comes, and uh, we're talking, and she says, you know, we visited with Dara and Nicholas, and she said, you ought to be doing the Blavatsky Letters Project. <laughs> I, didn't I say no? Um, so, <sighs> the universe wasn't going to quit. We had the conference here, and I was worried that the word was going to get to Tim Boyd. He was president and the uh, host of that conference. So I went to Tim Boyd, and I said, there's some folks here that are going to suggest that I take on the Blavatsky Letters Project. I was just intending to give him a heads up so he didn't get blindsided by this. Um, and instead of being sympathetic, he said, do it. <laughs> so that's how I got, kind of got volunteered for this. <laughs> I did not know what the hell I was doing. Um, I thought it would be easy. I looked at my proposal. I said, volume one this year, volume two and three would be the following year. Uh, no. So. That's how I got involved, and I started learning the process. Boris Dzerkov's folios, his manuscript, were here. And Janet Kirshner, the archivist, had a volunteer scan all of those pages, typescript, photocopies of uh, pages out of books and magazines. And so I had the, what uh, Boris had collected. And I started digitizing it and OCR and all that and getting it into to a format, footnoting, which I had done a little of that with the Mahapa letters. And, but um, then, and this is a segue from, from this, some folks in Russia heard what I was doing or found that I was doing it and said, you know, there's a bunch of letters in Russian that you guys have never seen. About 30 of them, I find out. Uh, fortunately, none of them belonged in volume one that John Algio had, but a dozen of them belonged in the volume that I thought was going to be volume two, made volume two a lot bigger. And then I, I thought, OK, I'll just get them translated. Easy. There's. And Joe, you know the process that I went through. How do I do this? Oh, just get some volunteers, some amateurs, get a bunch of them. Um, how do I evaluate the quality of their work? How do I, how do I know a good translation from a bad translation? Um, Joe offered to evaluate for me. He said, I don't have time to translate, but uh, I can take a look. But I wasn't happy. That wasn't going to work. This, I didn't want. Uh, a bad product. So fast forward to last year. 
One year ago now, we had the ITC in Berlin. As Herman suggested, I was interested in what Yulia was doing with the birthplace in Nipro, and I wanted to talk to her, and she wanted to talk to me about the letters project and the Russian letters. And by the way, there's a fellow there that's trying to do the opposite of what I'm doing. He wants to translate all of HPB's English into Russian, which is 10 times bigger than what I'm doing. Uh, 14 volumes of the collected writings. OK. So we were talking, and as Herman pointed out, when Yulia got to Berlin, she had hired a young woman to be her interpreter. And this is the night before her presentation on Nipro. We're uh, having dinner and, and talking. And this young Russian woman is sitting here interpreting. And she's just flawless, perfect. Um, and you would think uh, you could forget about it, but she was distracting me. I'm thinking, that's what I need. So when Yulia and I finished speaking, I said, could I talk to you? Do you do translations? And she pulls out her business card and said, sure. Uh, translation, interpreting, Russian, German, English, French, Italian. <laughs> she had gone to, she's from Siberia, but she'd gone to some special school for language training. And, and I'm thinking, well, this might work. So I emailed her, I think from Berlin. I, I had my laptop, so I just emailed her one of these Russian letters that had been of the dozen that I needed. And when I get home, I get it back an email. And some, we had some comments back and forth. She not only translated it well, but she caught some of HPB's turns of phrase. And um, for example, in the letter I gave her, they were, she, they were talking about a, a Russian guy whose name sounded like a vegetable, a, let's say potato. And when you translate it, of course, it's not going to sound like potato anymore. But she caught it, and she figured out how to uh, express that with, uh, and not just blow over it, which I thought, this is what I want. To, there's two sides of translation. One is to catch all those nuances and uh, turns of phrase and her idioms, and the other is I don't want you to know it's a translation until I tell you. So she was doing that. So I'm, I paid her. I wasn't going to talk about the money, but I will. Um, I paid her. She's a professional. But then I come back here, and I said I, I had a meeting with TPH, Barbara, and a bunch of uh, Floyd was there. And I said, here's what I need to do. I found a translator that can get this done correctly. Uh, I need you to pay for it. There's a, a, there's a fund here that was paying for my travel uh, to Adyar, to Australia. Uh, and I wanted, can we pay for a translator? And one, they wanted me under contract. We did that. Uh, two, they wanted to compare her translations to somebody else to get a, uh, is this good? So they took that same letter and a couple more and sent them to uh, a company down in Chicago near University of Chicago, Languages Unlimited or something like that. And I sent the other two to Anna. Um, we get them all back. They read them, compared them, and said, this girl from Berlin is pretty good. And they agreed, yes, we'll do this. So that brings us to the, this is the past year, since Berlin last year. So we get the 12 letters translated. I do my work and footnoting and cross-referencing and so forth. And um, we now have a nice product, in my opinion. I think it's something that you will enjoy. And, and uh, this is uh, for the movement. HPB's letters, many of them have not been, well, the dozen have never been read in English, except by me and the translator and maybe one or two other people. So this is fresh. You've never seen this. 
There are letters at Adyar, a couple letters from HPB to Colonel Alcott, never been published anywhere. So this is uh, a gift to the Theosophical Movement. Um, so that's where we are today. Uh, volume two has been sent to the editor, and I've been told I can't fiddle with it anymore. So I moved on to volume three, starting 1884. And that keeps me working and so far. I can deal with the English letters. But TPH told me don't give any more to the translator because we don't know how much money we've got. We won't know until the, the book, we have to pay the editor, we have to pay the, uh, for the index, we, have, I'm, we need to uh, get the production, the physical production of the book. We don't, they don't know how much it is, so they told me not to spend any money. Uh, so, but I can continue working on volume three. I don't know much more about volume two. I hope that it will be available end of the year, maybe early next year. So we'll see. And it'll be easier for me to do volume three because now I know what I'm doing. Um, I have a translator uh, and so forth. So that's, that's the project. Does anybody have any questions about, about this? Thank you. Well, certainly every one of us completely is in awe of your devotion to this very important work, so thank you. Um, it just occurred to me that since the international theosophy conferences are a confluence or a platform for so many different organizations throughout the world, and many of us have publications that we would like to see translated into different languages, that perhaps there could be a a page on the ITC webpage that lists good translators from X language to Y language who understand theosophy well enough to get the spirit of the meaning and the idiomatic phrases and you know just people that we know to be excellent because the fact that you know Anna is excellent is great and you just told us but you know maybe there's somebody else somewhere else who really needs that person and doesn't know where to go to find them and so then maybe we could have that. It's just a thought, but I wanted to share it. Anna is now married. She's working in Indonesia in some larger project, but it's not permanent, not a permanent move. Uh, I imagine she'll be back in Berlin at some point. Um, I get her first. <laughs> She was quite distracting. I was thinking I was, if I was only 45 years younger. <laughs> Any other questions? John, the scope of your work is pretty incredible, so I wanted to thank you for it. Can you give us a hint of um, one of the letters and what they say? Yeah, um, they run everywhere from the trivial. A lot of her letters to her sister and her aunt and her family back in Russia uh, are just, you know, kind of, how are you doing? Why is Auntie doing this? And uh, uh, very personal, but others, I just had one, this is 1884, so it's next, it's volume three, where a bunch of folks in the London Lodge, they're having some uh, turmoil between the Senate folks with the Mahatma uh, letters and Anna Bonus Kingsford and the Hermeticists. The London Lodge was very eclectic. Uh, so they were talking about forming an inner group to study Senate's material. KH had written the letters suggesting that they do that. So they, HPB is in London at the time. She's staying at the Arendelles home, 77 Elgin Crescent, I think is the address. And they give her a, per, a petition 
and a pledge that they're going to uh, form this inner group. On the petition, this is in volume eight, I think, of the collected writings, so it's not in, in my book, I just excerpt from it. Uh, this petition, KH writes a couple of remarks on it in blue. Moria just says, approved in red, short and sweet. Uh, and H HPB writes a comment, a paragraph in there. Yes, provided that you don't, uh, uh, that you are committed to this. KH writes and you don't give the, the secrets away. So they approve this. Then HPB turns around and writes the letter. A long, we don't have page one, but a long letter to the London Lodge telling them why uh, they need to up their game. They need to start taking this stuff seriously, and if you do, we will. Uh, HPB is writing in a tone of voice that's not trivial, that's not like her letters uh, to her aunt or her sister. Over the time I spent with these letters, you would think that I would know HPB. But what I know is that there's a lot of HPB. Sometimes it's Helena, sometimes it's something, sometimes she says, boss tells me to say so and so, and you know she's uh, being, it's, it's being dictated by uh, Mahatma Moria. But other times, like this letter to this inner group in London, she is just business, and it's serious. Um, it's been published a couple times, and one in the Theosophist, it was called A Valuable Lesson. Uh, but there, what's been published is abridgments or uh, segments, so in this, in volume three, there will be the, the full letter. We're missing page one. But that's a, an example uh, of what she's doing. The Russian letters in volume two, she's, many of them are written to a fellow named A.N. Aksakov in Russia, who is a researcher working on or trying to discover what's going on in the seance rooms. And so there's a lot of stuff in these Russian letters about um, the elementaries. And uh, the Russian term that she uses is kikamora. Uh, kikamori is a, a spook or a, a um, the, it's not a spirit as she's telling Aksakov. It's not the human, it's the, the reliquy or the, the um, what's left of the human haunting the, the seance room. So that's an, another example of what she's writing about. And you haven't read these letters in English. Yeah. Thanks. Um. I'm sorry, we, we yeah. also have Ananya and Nancy uh, to present about the TOS. So thank you, John, and we, will, we can find you whenever. Yes, any other questions, I'll be here. We have questions. I'll be here all week. You're waving? Did I miss something? Oh, there was one up here. Well, you didn't finish okay, it. Hang on one second. Oh. Yeah. There is another important point about all that uh, Russian business is um, during uh, this conference, we spoke about the translations and the work of uh, John's uh, uh, translation work and work on the uh, Blavatsky letters. And also, uh, we get aware of the fact that there was an, a problem with the financial resources to do the other translations. And then the idea coming up, why not adapting a letter? Adopt, sorry. Adopt a letter so that you like to pay for the translations or part of a letter. Because it is so general interest to all theosophists that it is a little bit uh, pity that it is hanging around on something where everybody is waiting for. And maybe we want really to date, donate the translator. Of course, that has to be coordinated with John and with, uh, with Barbara. Uh, the uh, TPH and so on to get a good working condition. But I think uh, if we help to, uh, in this level, by in financial support, I think that can only be welcome. Yeah? And uh, we all like to see the letters. Uh, the same thing, of course, is true for the Dnipro uh, Blavatsky Museum. There has a lot of things to be done. 
uh, if we are able to help, not only with money, but also by uh, supporting the uh, thing and the work. And uh, if you are interested, we have here the uh, bank information, to maybe to start with. And on the other hand, if you like to support in all type of works to get the thing running there and to explore much more, I think uh, contact uh, uh, us from ITC. We have direct contact on the moment and we can try to coordinate uh, what was going on. Uh, uh, Maurice uh, Bischoff is also a person who has contact with the ladies over there. So, but I think maybe the best is try to coordinate everything as so good as possible so that we have the most effect from all the work what, is, uh, what will be done. Okay, thank you. Yeah. After we visited uh, Dnipro, I have two locations. I visited uh, Dnipro in 2016 yeah. and I reported to the supporters and I personally donated. But why not to make the project to support Dnipro? Why yeah. not to make a project of one or another society to support Dnipro? Okay. Well, we have done already in the, in the form of label, uh, labor, sorry. What a good idea. I think it's good to discuss it, but... Okay, G good suggestion. Yeah, but one, one is amount of hundred euros, not more than thousand euros. Their budget is. But you have to realize one thing: uh, what what is needed is a very good planning and a very good approach. Just because just money is not sufficient. We were there for uh, three, four days. Yeah, we were flying there on the cost of the Point Loma Society. We spent money for, uh, uh, let's say, video material we needed. We will work on it. And that is also a way of supporting the center and explore the center in a more, uh, let's say, international type of approach. Yeah? We have all sympathy with what you say. Don't worry. But we have to do, to do it in a good, coordinated way. Yeah? Okay. I think it will be very welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, we have the information here. Yeah. My, my personal approach is that first make them more international known, that you can also better international support. Yeah? And that is an important thing. You simply don't understand the situation. I have been there. Because I have been there. Have, they don't have the, the cash. They don't have simple cash. Okay. Fine, we stop this see. discussion. I understand what you say. You understand what I say. Yes. We will work it out. Talk yeah? Later. Really quickly, I just want to thank Herman. Um, I didn't ask for this support, but it's wonderful. God bless.